captured our time for all time, captured us perfectly down to the last wrinkle and cough and mannerism for all our descendants to see, that medium is fragile. It etches us in history, but itself stands in danger of crumbling. The medium is celluloid, film, a few inches wide and as long as the century. Film is a legacy in need of care now, which is why we have called David Browning's report Restoration Period. You can tell the politician to burn that bit of paper now. That's the bit that's missing. Yes. They are making Lawrence of Arabia all over again. All you want is someone holding down the Turkish right. Or at least small parts of it. We'll get there before you do. Peter well, O'Toole inspecting himself as he was nearly 30 years ago. What do I say after this? Re-recording lost bits of dialogue. But we've come back after the scene with Claudie. The 16th. And Can you do it? O'Toole and director David Lean trying to figure out what was said on a piece of film cut out of the movie. The soundtrack has been lost. That's the blue is lost or black. Blue is lost. Blue is lost. Oh, I see. So that's all right. The Lawrence that Lean and O'Toole made in the sands of Morocco and Jordan ran three hours and 42 minutes at its premiere. 20 minutes were cut out so theaters could squeeze in an extra showing a day. 15 minutes more were cut when the film went on television. The bits and pieces aging away in bolts on two continents. To reconstruct it all would be a nightmare. But fans of the film lobbied Columbia Pictures to get it done. I was 14 or 15 years old. It was in Phoenix, Arizona. One of those fans, director Steven Spielberg, has special reason to remember the first time he saw Lawrence of Arabia. Lawrence of Arabia, pretty master, real 180. The light slowly went down, and four layers of curtain opened, and and finally, uh, you know, the Columbia lady with the torch came out, and Lawrence began. There was a sweep and a scope to the movie that uh, I could feel the air coming off the screen ruffling my hair. No prisoners! No prisoners! I was almost as mad as Lawrence at the end. You know, he swept up into this, into this mad glory. out of the theater and I knew that filmmaking was no longer a hobby it was something I really wanted to do for the rest of my life I wanted to be a movie director based on that event that really propelled you into your career yes come on then no wonder then that Spielberg helped direct the campaign to get Lawrence restored to its full original widescreen state it was a technical triumph and a happy ending for a neglected masterpiece but it's not the only example of lost, faded, or chopped up films restored to life. Well, I don't pay that much for my, my Sunday britches. For instance, there is Becky Sharp, 1935, the first full-length feature in modern Technicolor. A faded shadow colors drab the sound murky. Did you or did you not promise me that Lord Stain had have me appointed to some post? Well, I've spoken to him, and he thinks you'd make a very fine console. But look at what a little tender, loving care can do. It's no electronic trick, no computer colors. It's film restoration, pure and simple. In this case, the UCLA Film Archives tracking down the original negative, making a new print, and clearing the cobwebs away. Dying for their country. Well, I'm dying for my breakfast. It works on black and white, too. You may be used to seeing My Man Godfrey like this. The film, probably a blurry copy of a copy of a copy. Turn around let me look at you. You're the cutest thing I've ever seen. Thank you. Will there be anything else? Yes, sit down and talk to me. But careful cleaning and reprinting brings it out of the shadows. Butler, you're the first protege I ever had. Protege? You know, like Carlo. Uh, and for Carlos? further proof of the wonders of film restoration, look in the vaults of Turner Entertainment, which owns the most famous movie of all time. Red, you go home. What shall I go? What shall I 
I do. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Existing prints of Gone with the Wind have deteriorated so that whole generations may have grown up thinking it was supposed to look all purplish and dark. <laughs> Over the years, duplication had been its own enemy. You lose subtleties of tone and sharpness and you build up grain. This was the problem with it. It was a victim of its own popularity. Dick May of Turner supervised the 50th anniversary restoration of Gone with the Wind, going back to the original negatives stored all these years deep within a salt mine in Kansas. They produced astonishing color. Friend from Charleston, Captain Rhett Butler. We had the luxury of having two years to work on it to really get it right. And there was a lot of slow, go back, try again, uh, trial and error to be sure we had the color exactly right and the mood exactly right, and then the work on the soundtrack. But what difference does it make who you marry, so long as he's a southerner and thinks like you? And Compare the prints you're used to seeing on the right, the brand new copy on the left. You mean to tell me, Katie Scarlett O'Hara, the terror that land doesn't mean anything to you? White land is the only thing. At one time, all the old classic Warner Brothers Bogart movies and Ronald Reagan movies or whatever used to be in here. And of course now... The man they call the godfather of film restoration is Robert Gitt of the UCLA archives. He searches studio vaults and libraries around the world looking for lost scraps of sound and picture. That sounds interesting. Yeah. Yeah, see, there is some good stuff still here. Yeah. Here at Warner Brothers, Git goes through the late Jack Warner's private vault, where even the studio veterans aren't sure what all those old cans contain. King's radio address. Oh, yeah. And here, Git is at the editing bench where he continues his detective work. Today, restoring one of the very earliest talking pictures, Noah's Ark from 1928. A film so chopped up over the years that reassembling it is like putting together a moving jigsaw puzzle. This was basically a lost film as far as the complete version is concerned. Uh, we got a nine reel version of this movie from the Cinémathèque Française in Paris. An 11 reel version, but with certain sections missing, was found at Warner Brothers in Burbank in their vaults. And a seven reel version with certain other scenes that aren't in the two other prints were found at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. So we're basically putting all of these together now to try to restore the original full running time. Now here's a situation where this print has some scenes that were cut out of this one. So um, I've slugged in the exact length of leader. It's a tricky process because the movie was made with the sound on big discs that had to be synchronized with the film. Wonderful how it train wrecks all this together, isn't it, Marie? For half a century, the discs were missing until Git discovered them, stashed away with some junk at Warner Brothers. It's not a masterpiece exactly, but it's it moves along. It's it's a, it's a well-made film. So nobody has really seen the film, I would say, for about 60 years. Once again, and welcome to Preserving and restoring film isn't just the right thing to do, it's also becoming a profitable thing. More and more cable stations are running old movies, American movie classics, Ted Turner's TNT, and others. What we have found over the years is if you keep preserving things, something will come along which will make it economically sound for you to have done so. Roger Mayer is president of Turner Entertainment. There are movies that we preserved 10, 15 years ago and have not used since that all of a sudden have a purpose and have a use. So really it's a, it's a sound economic thing to do because somebody's going to come up with a new way of showing movies and if it's uh, satellites to your garage. Well, what's happening here is, is that the perforations were completely torn apart. As a result, gone. these are boom times at film labs that specialize in restoring old movies. At YCM Labs, Richard Dayton is cleaning up old soundtracks, trying to get the pops and crackles out. And there are the expert hands of Felipe Herba, gently, lovingly making repairs on the Fred Astaire movie Damsels in Distress. It looks kind of a primitive way of doing it, but there's no best way. This is not a print. It's the original negative that went through the camera 52 years ago. 
<laughs> the thing that really gets me sometimes is movies that I saw when I was younger, you know, you know as a child. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, would I ever have thought that I would have this negative in my hands and make a new print of this, you know? And, uh, if it's naughty, bad for men, sleep each morning till after 10, then the answer is yes, I want to be fair. And as eerie as it might sound, technicians can actually improve on what the camera recorded so long ago. We are looking at follow-through from the year 1930, one of the very few early Technicolor films for which the negative still survives. Printed on modern film stock, and the quality is amazing. But for film historians, it's a race against the clock and chemistry. For until safety film came along in the 1950s, movies were made on nitrate film, which becomes unstable with age. At archives around the world, nitrate is decomposing, turning to dangerous, flammable goo. Feature films, newsreels, the sights and sounds of a century vanishing. There is a saying among archivists, nitrate won't wait. And those materials before 1950 will inevitably, with absolute certainty, disappear, and tragically, if you care about them. Bob Rosen's UCLA archives have already saved some early Laurel and Hardys, some Burns and Allen from disintegration, but there's not nearly enough money to copy all the other tens of millions of feet of nitrate film turned out by the studios so long ago. What really is involved here is the collective memory of our century. And to let it turn to dust really, really is, is a shame, and it, it is an enormous loss that future generations will blame us for. Every studio, I think, needs to go backlog and, and, and become little Indiana Joneses, become little adventurer archaeologists, and find out what they've got in the vaults that uh, we might enjoy and, and, and help save some of these films and help save, save some of their own classics. We leave you with one happy ending. I wonder where Helen is. She should be here by this time. For half a century, Hollywood has known that Howard Hughes shot part of his epic Hell's Angels in primitive color, but the film was lost until the late John Wayne's son found a copy in the actor's private film library. An American movie classic snapped it up for showing in the spring. Oh, Helen! Really? And there it is the only known color footage of Jean Harlow, taken in 1930 when she was 19 years old. A rare piece of film history rediscovered. Helen, may I have this next dance? Of course. 